Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. So what we're looking at here is a, a CRT screen. It's an Omnivision brand. This is a replacement screen for a Yasnak MX3 or LX3 control. Uh, the machine uses a TTL video signal. So it has a vertical sync, a horizontal sync, and an intensity all in uh, TTL or digital format basically and uh, what you can see on the screen is basically there's three duplicate images and they're kind of offset diagonally so there's something wrong with the horizontal sync and it's got an adjustment for horizontal hold and if I adjust the horizontal hold you can see it latches there but it still actually has two versions of the image and then here it has three versions of the image so something's wrong with the horizontal oscillator or the horizontal sync signal so what let's see what we can figure out all right real quick I couldn't find a schematic for this exact CRT but I found one that's I think pretty close and this chip right here this MC1391 chip is the control for the horizontal section of the of the CRT and it has an it's an 8-pin chip so pin 3 right here is the horizontal sync input so that comes from uh, pin 6 on the on the uh, edge connector of the card and then pin 7 is the oscillator and pin 1 is the driver that goes out to these two transistors which actually drives the flyback transformer so here's your flyback transformer here and then it's going to get feedback on pin 4 and then pin 4 is supposed to work with pin 5 to shift the oscillator to make everything match up so I'm not an expert about CRTs but from what I gather this output here to these to these transistors should be roughly the same as the horizontal sync frequency Okay, so what you're seeing on the scope, the top channel one is hooked up to pin three, which is the horizontal sync input coming from the machine. And then channel two is hooked up to the, channel two is hooked up to pin one, which is driving the output transistor that runs the whole entire horizontal section of this, uh, of this CRT. And you see that the frequency is fluttering around a bit I'm not sure exactly why but uh, the most important thing to note is yeah the, the horizontal sync signal is around 17 kilohertz and it's outputting a signal at 26 kilohertz so those things should basically be the same in order to get a horizontal lock okay so I'm gonna adjust the horizontal hold pot okay so now the screens showing three images instead of two and we've dropped our frequency down to 22 So we're going from 22, maybe 23 kilohertz. To 26. So we need to figure out what's going on here. I've checked this capacitor, this capacitor, this capacitor, all the resistors, this capacitor, this capacitor and everything has checked out okay so far. I've checked the ESR on every electrolytic ca capacitor in the board and they all seem to be good. So I'm starting to think that maybe just this IC is bad. Okay, so I ordered and received a new horizontal driver chip for this CRT and I'm gonna go ahead and install that. I actually bought two and I couldn't find a, I could not find a compatible new replacement so I had to buy some NOS chips off of eBay. I've never had any luck taking these ICs out in one piece especially because this is a double-sided PCB so uh, you can get in real trouble trying to take those out you know in one piece. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut the legs and remove it that way.
All right, so I'll just go ahead and unsolder the pins, and uh, we'll go ahead and pull this each pin out individually. Okay, that's it. All right, so as you can see, there's been no change. So obviously we have not found the problem. Okay, so it's working, kind of. What I did is, uh, you can see it right here. I just bodged in a, a 4.7 K ohm resistor into the oscillator circuit. And there's a resistor, a pot, and a capacitor right here that set the frequency of the oscillator. And I just couldn't get the oscillator frequency to go below 22, uh, 22 kilohertz. And it needs to be like 17 kilohertz in order to play nice with this TTL signal. And I can't change the capacitor. So I'll, I just increased the resistance right here by soldering an additional 4.7 K ohm resistor in series with these other resistors and that brought the that brought the oscillator frequency down to between 16 and 19 kilohertz and that's enough to get to get the uh, horizontal feedback system to lock on to the correct signal so see these spots right here this one and this one that's a diode that comes through the board and I think that what happened is the the insertion machine when they were making this board I mean this isn't a hand solder this is this is an automated system I think that the insertion machine got the diode a little bit out of position when it shoved it through and it tore the the uh, pad loose from the board and then when they uh, you know flow soldered it it made the connection so the board went ahead and passed you know past QC but looks like crap so I'm gonna see if I can fix that real quick so I was trying to wick off some of this big gob of solder Okay, so this side looks like it's actually okay. It's just the other side that's actually torn. Okay, so the pad is torn from the board, but it looks like it's still in one piece. Okay, so this is a double-sided PCB, and uh, I can take and stick this 
this torn pad back down to the board with some high temperature epoxy. But the problem is that this is a what's called a plated through hole, meaning that there should be copper going all the way through the board at this location. And if it if the machine destroyed that pad when it pushed the the diode through, or possibly whoever worked on this board last this board's been worked on several times before, I'm sure. Uh, destroyed that they destroyed the connection between the pad and the through hole so it's a little bit more tricky to repair this is a single-sided board we just glue this back down and move on with life but I think what I'm gonna do is uh, I've got some eyelets so I will stick this pad back down to the board first with my epoxy and then once the epoxy has set I'll go ahead and put a an eyelet in this location. The other one looks fine, so I don't have to do anything with that. Alright, so the epoxy I'm going to use is this CW2500 by CircuitWorks. It's a two-part epoxy that supposedly can handle 65 or 600 degrees Fahrenheit for a few seconds. So it's sold as an overcoat, so you're supposed to use it to go over top of damage traces or to repair a solder mask, but I find that it works just fine as far as uh, you know sticking down these torn traces or or pads okay so our uh, epoxy is good and hard it's been sitting for 48 hours so I'll go ahead and get this taken apart uh, I just put this little tiny bar clamp on here with a piece of foam and then I, I put a piece of uh, just a piece of scotch tape over top of the epoxy I'm just going to try to clean up the top of this pad real quickly. Just scrape off any of the epoxy overcoat that might have covered up the solder pad here. So uh, now what I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to tin the top of it with some solder. Oh, maybe a little flux would be a good idea first. Now you don't need much, but we need something for the the new pin. There we go. We need something to basically solder the new pin to, or the sorry, the eyelet to. So when we when we push the eyelet through, uh, we'll butt it up against this tin surface and then we'll have to uh, reheat it with the tip of our iron and that'll make a good electrical connection between what's left of the pad and the new eyelet. So I'll do the same thing on the other side and then we'll get ready to put in the eyelet. Okay so to repair the plated through hole we're going to use an eyelet and there's a few companies that make these but um, I purchased these from Best and you can see their URL here solder.net and I have three different sizes here and uh, kind of the the part number here explains the different dimensions so they're 48 thousandths inside diameter, 59 thousandths outside diameter, 93 thousandths length underneath the flange and then I've just got a small drill bit in a pin chuck here and we'll drill out the existing hole to fit the eyelet and install it Okay, this drill bit's just a few thousandths bigger than the outside diameter of the eyelet. So we'll just come in here. Should be pretty easy to drill. Just turning it by hand. Okay, now we have to swage the eyelet in place. Okay, so we'll swage that eyelet real quick. And there's lots of tools you can buy to do this, but I, I don't... If you're reasonably equipped in the shop, you don't need them. So what I use is, this is a center punch here. And then I've got a small prick punch 
a flat punch and then this sharp scriber. So what we're going to do, it doesn't take hardly any force to, to actually do this. These eyelets are made from really thin, a thin type of uh, copper. And you can easily swage them by hand. So what I'm going to do is carefully set the flange side of the eyelet on the center punch, like so. Okay, so now that the eyelet is sitting on top of the center punched mark, and we're just going to push down and then kind of orbit around with this scribing tool. Okay, so you see it kind of bell mouthed out. Now I'll use this uh, prick punch, it's a little bit fatter, and just do the same thing. Like so. So now we're really a bell mouthed. Now we can just use this flat punch. Okay, you see that? It looks pretty pretty darn good to me. So I'm just going to flatten the other side a little bit, just a hair with my flat punch. Okay, that's it. That's the eyelet's installed. It's real painless. Uh, we're ready now to basically uh, hit this with our soldering iron, remelt that solder that we put on the, the pad, and then we'll test for continuity. Good to go. Okay, so here and here were those super nasty crusty solder joints that we repaired and this one has the new eyelet installed in the plated through hole and everything's been soldered back in and it looks like it should have originally. Okay guys, I've got the board cleaned up and it's ready to be installed back in the chassis. So this is the spot right here where we installed that eyelet and if you didn't know that I had done that there's no way you could tell. So I've gone ahead and replaced all the electrolytic capacitors as well. This board's not as old as the last one I worked on, but you know, for four or five dollars worth of components, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and replace them all. So we have some peace of mind. Okay, that's the finished product. Pretty hard to argue with that. You got a nice clean picture. Linearity's good. And remember we had a little bit of a kind of a oscillation in, in this section right here but since I replaced the electrolytic capacitors everything seems to be fine now so we must have had a, a filtering issue there and yeah nice stable picture we'll let it run for a couple hours and make sure everything is cool okay guys so the CRT is put back together everything is tested it's working here's what I think happened so here's a bunch of components that I replaced out of this PCB I don't think any of them were bad they were all you know fairly close to the spec what I think happened is I have two machines here that have uh, Yasnac controls one has an LX3 one has an MX3 I think what happened is that the original CRT for the MX3 control died and rather than fix it someone ordered this Omnivision as a replacement and they gave them the specs and basically this monitor was built to work with that control and that control has a 23 kilohertz horizontal sync signal so they set up on the schematic they set up this oscillator frequency to run at 23 kilohertz so you can see I did the math it has this this uh, formula here that you can use to calculate the oscillator frequency the, the uh, nominal frequency and I think what they did is they set it up to run at 23 kilohertz but I think that they missed the they missed the sweet spot, so it was right on the edge of it either being too high or too low to be compatible with that oscillator frequency, and it was way too high in order to be compatible with the lathe because the lathe has a 17 kilohertz horizontal uh, sync signal, and I have no explanation for why there's a difference between the lathe and the mill. They're 
from the same vintage. They share the same hardware. I don't have an explanation for that. But what I did is I more or less cheated. So it, by changing the values of these resistors, you can change the nominal frequency of the oscillator. So what I did is I just changed this trim pot from a 2K to a 10K. And now I have the ability to adjust the total resistance from 12 to 22 uh, kilo ohms. And that allows me to adjust the oscillator frequency anywhere from 15 to 25 or so kilohertz. So now the CRT is basically compatible with both of my machines. Now, I don't understand if there's... I don't actually know, I guess, if there's a, a standard that Yaskawa was following when they made these... Uh, when they set up the video signal. It kind of seems like they just did whatever they wanted, and then they built or spec'd a CRT to work with it. Okay, so I guess the, the lesson here is that uh, all's well that ends well. You know, I wasted a lot of time monkeying around with this thing, mostly because I didn't understand what I was doing, but I was able to learn a lot. And the end result is that I have a, a CRT monitor that's compatible with both of my machines. And if I needed to modify it again to be compatible with a different machine, I understand how to do it.